Wolverines are one of the most misunderstood jazz bands of the 1920s. Widely known as a launching pad for the great Big Spiderbeck, who was undeniably the best player in the band, the rest of them have been damned by ill-informed critics ever since as a mediocre backing band of also-rans. And sure, if you expect them to sound like Bix and his gang in 1927, or Eddie Condon in 1955, you're going to be disappointed. In this video, I'm going to discuss what I think makes their record so special, without imposing any such anachronistic ideas about their intentions. The Wolverines approached eighth notes in a very uneven manner. Instead of playing them equally, they treated them more like a dotted eighth and a sixteenth. Far from this being a failed attempt to swing, as some ill-informed critics of the band have believed, this hotsy totsy approach was expected of any young and fashionable pot dance musician in 1924. In fact, comparisons to New York contemporaries, such as the California Ramblers and their associated small groups, find the Wolverines articulating their eighth notes less strenuously thereby achieving a smoother, though less frenetic, effect. Their uneven eighth notes are the result of a collective and effective musical approach, rather than a failure to play in some other manner. Take, for example, the loping rhythmic optimism of I Need Some Pattern. Bix and the Wolverines were inspired in part by the original Dixieland jazz band, not only in repertoire, think Fidgety Feet, Royal Garden Blues, Jazz Me Blues, but also performance conventions. They frequently end tunes with the tag ending sometimes referred to as a silent cowbell ending, or a dogleg tag. Here they are adding this tag to Riverboat Shuffle, in spite of it being a new composition by their friend Hoagie Carmichael. All of the Wolverines records feature a front line of cornet, clarinet, and tenor sax. While some also feature either Al Gandhi or George Bruni's on trombone, I'd argue that the sound the band achieves with the three-piece front line is more characteristic, so that's what I'm going to focus on. It was more typical to have cornet, clarinet, and trombone in a front line during 1924, and the substitution of the tenor sax for the trombone affects not only the band's sound, but also how it functions from an arranging perspective. The tenor sax is capable of easily playing in a higher register than the trombone, enabling the three horns to play in close harmony very effectively. Consequently, the horns are well suited to playing harmonized figures in concert, functioning like a brass or a sax section, before breaking off and fulfilling separate roles in ad-lib ensembles. The clarinet usually plays a harmony line above the cornet lead, with the tenor playing a harmony line below, as in the verse of Riverboat Shuffle. Here's another example from the verse of Susie. Wolverine's records often make use of tenor sax melody choruses, where George Johnson gives a somewhat sweet and earnest reading of the melody. These solo statements ensure the original melody receives attention, and also provide a welcome contrast to the freewheeling ensemble sound. Here's Johnson on Tijuana.
here he is on I Need Some Pattern. The Wolverines also used breaks to vary the band's sound. As well as solo breaks, they make use of horns in harmony, even incorporating the sousaphone too at times. Here are some harmonized breaks from Riverboat Shuffle. And here are some breaks with all of the horns and the sousaphone too. Note that these breaks often provide short connecting phrases between sections with whole tone elements. This is from Tijuana. And this is from I Need Some Pattern. I'm not a huge fan of Min Laybrook's later bass sax playing, which suffers by inevitable comparisons with the virtuoso Adrian Rollini, but I just love Min's sousaphone playing on the Wolverines records. He plays more mobile and complex lines than most bass players were risking in 1924. Have a listen to him under Bix's solo on I Need Some Pattern. He seems to provide more of a counter melody than a bass line. And just listen to Min's confident support as Bix sails into the penultimate chorus of Tijuana. When discussing the Wolverines, one concept that must be addressed sooner or later is sock time. Original sources differ on what sock time rhythm actually means. Some suggest that it accentuates the offbeats, some insist it is beat one that is emphasised, while others claim it is an even four to the bar feel. Instead of adding to the confusion, I thought it would be best if I just provided my vote for the sockiest sock time chorus ever recorded, the final ensemble on Tijuana. Listen to the subtle rhythmic interplay between the horns and the rhythm section, especially the tuba. No one's playing loud, hard, or high, and yet it really gets under my skin rhythmically. It's like being knocked over by understatement.
How ironic it is that historians and critics have focused on the standout star of the Wolverines, the tragic hero Big Spiderbeck. In mythologizing one of the Wolverines, they have all too often lost sight of the band's true achievement, a cohesive style very much built upon a collective musical understanding and esprit de corps.